Mate, you and I both looked at Gough Whitlam as, a, as an urban, urban policy legend. He said in his famous 1972 speech in Blacktown, and I won't do it in accent, a national government which cuts itself off from the responsibility for the nation's cities is cutting itself off from the nation's real life. A national government which has nothing to say about cities has nothing relevant or enduring to say about the nation or the nation's future. You are famous in Canberra for being a federal politician who's always spoken about cities. I think Australia's first minister for cities uh, and continuing that. And you've even also helped give us the airport you need. But there's another William, Whitlam esque uh, challenge. Gough famously came to power by sewering the western suburbs of Sydney and Melbourne. Not a federal responsibility, but he stepped in. So we look towards you and Michelle and others, Ned and others, to don't let that latte line that goes diagonally across Sydney, or the Colourbon fence, I like to call it, don't let it become the digital divide where it's good internet access on one side and it's less on the other side. We can't get our kids to enjoy the spoils of a knowledge economy if they can't get the portal into the information superhighway. It's really important for us. Anyway, it's enough for the warm up act. Now for the, now, it's now time for the main event. You know he was he, he's the young man raised by a single mother in a housing commission flat in Camperdown. You've heard the story. But this time it's not just another prime ministerial rebranding exercise. We've had enough of them. It's a genuine story of a kid who made it to the top by hard work, by dent of educational scholarships, support from family, and importantly, good government services. And I know Anthony's committed himself to rebuilding government as, as a service provider. This log cabin story resonates very well in our region. It's a region that repays loyalty and rewards hard work. Local success stories are all throughout this room today. Look at Sally Situ, the, you know, from a family of La Chinese Laotian refugees came here and she's now the federal member for this very seat. Frank Calabria for the mean streets of Greystones kicked on to be the head of, uh, head of Origin Energy. Matt Moran, who's cooking our food today, who's the new celebrity chef at the stadium, uh, raised out of, out of Seven Hills and, and Badgeries Creek. And, uh, and it, it is, there's so many, there's countless stories across this room on every table people have had that success. But unlike his predecessor, Albo's not a nickname he made up for himself. That's just purely un-Australian thing to do. And he generally does like our kind of footy. He's comfortable in modern Australia. He's largely ended the climate wars we're all hoping for. And he's steadily rebuilding our reputation in Paris, Honiara, and maybe even Beijing. Would you please make welcome to the stage a very good friend of our region, the 31st Prime Minister of Australia to deliver the Lachlan Macquarie Lecture, the honorary, honorary, Honourable Anthony Albanese. Well, thanks very much, Brownie, and thanks for the invitation uh, to be with you here uh, today, this afternoon. Uh, can I acknowledge uh, the members of my team, the, uh, the fantastic Michelle Rowland, who indeed is committed to delivering an MBN. Who knew fibre was better than copper? Who knew in the 21st century? Uh, Michelle knew, as did anyone else, uh, who knew that the world was round and not flat. And that is why we are busy fixing the MBN. Jason Clare, uh, who will make a, a just amazing education minister, who's absolutely committed to education as being the key to creating opportunity and to overcoming uh, disadvantage and the accident of birth that should not determine our path in life. Jason understands that. And uh, that's why he will make an amazing education minister. Uh, to the rest of my team who are here, uh, Sue Templeman, uh, Mike Freelander, Andrew Charlton and Sally Situ, the local member here, uh, thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, to uh, New South Wales shadow ministers, and I, I hope future ministers, uh, John Graham and, and Rose Jackson, good friends of mine, thank you for, for coming along. And can I give a shout out to Sarah Mansour? Uh, that was amazing. That was amazing. Give her a clap. <laughs> An example of how enriched we are by multicultural Australia. But there were people here before 1788. And that's why I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, 
and recommit on behalf of the Australian Government to the implementation of the Uluru Statement from the Heart in full, including a constitutionally enshrined voice to our national parliament. We share this ancient continent with the oldest continuous culture on earth. It is such a strength. It should be a source of national pride. And our constitution is our nation's birth certificate. And it's inadequate. While it doesn't reflect pride in the at least 60,000 years of that continuous culture. Uh, we're going to give every Australian the opportunity to have a say on this. And I thank Western Sydney uh, Dialogue uh, for uh, joining the stampede of support that is occurring from the business community, from civil society, from sporting organisations uh, to right this wrong. Uh, this is about First Nations people. And we know that uh, Western Sydney is the home to the largest population of uh, Aboriginal Australians in urban Australia. And it is about uh, respect and acknowledgement for them. But it's about something that's much more than that as well. This generous and gracious offer this handout is an opportunity to uplift our entire nation, to uplift in the way that we see ourselves. So for non-Indigenous Australia, I say do something for yourself as well as for Indigenous Australians. Do something for how you see uh, your country and your place in this country and get on board with this campaign and speak to people about it. We will hold the referendum sometime between July of next year and in the next financial year. And uh, this is an opportunity that cannot be lost. Some people say it's a risk. i tell you what's a risk. Um, a risk is uh, not saying you're not gonna lose a football game out on this stadium by not running on the field by forfeiting, and that's not what not having a vote would do. Uh, they've been pretty patient. There were five years leading up to the Uluru Statement from the Heart. It's been five years since the Uluru Statement from the Heart. If not now, when? If not you, who's going to get it done? You have an opportunity to get it done, and we will get it done and we will be a much better country, not just in our own eyes, but in the world's eyes when we get it done. <laughs> it's fitting, of course, today, uh, the Pamela Wai uh, Prize, and uh, of course, uh, someone who led a resistance against British settlers during the frontier wars including the significant confrontation uh, that Professor Shergold referred to uh, that occurred just up the road here in Parramatta. Uh, we do need to acknowledge our real history uh, because that's how you truly advance reconciliation. Look, it is fantastic to be back here at the Western Sydney uh, Leadership Dialogue. Um, I say to, uh, I say to Brownie, uh, don't feel too bad about what happened uh, last week. Uh, I know he's in therapy. I'm still in therapy from the week before. <laughs> but uh, I at least have 2014 to look back on. Uh, uh, too soon? <laughs> um, preparing for uh, this uh, speech today got me thinking about uh, the many ways that Western Sydney and Greater Western Sydney have grown and changed in my lifetime. Uh, Singh has replaced Smith as the most common surname in Blacktown and in Campbelltown. Uh, shops that sell bubble tea and sugarcane juice have joined the delis run by Greek and Italian migrants. 
and Western Sydney residents are among the most likely to speak a language other than English. And that is one of the reasons why uh, the Minister for Communications, Michelle Rowland, has commissioned the feasibility study into moving the headquarters of SBS to Western Sydney. We'll wait and see, of course, what the study says, but it certainly makes sense for such a fast-growing multicultural community to be the home of the broadcaster that celebrates and serves Australia's diversity. It would be an important cultural investment in Western Sydney, a creator of construction jobs, but much more, a creator of social capital, not just physical capital uh, in this area. The diversity of Western Sydney is a, is a local treasure, but it's also a national asset that should be celebrated. It enriches our cultural life and it drives our economic growth. One of the great things about this area through the generations is the culture of aspiration and entrepreneurship and innovation. People who've come to this great country to build a better lives for themselves and their children and grandchildren to come. People who've had a willingness to work hard and to take risks to start businesses and create jobs and we all benefit uh, from that. Uh, Western Sydney really is uh, the centre of aspiration in this country, and we all benefit from it. Western Sydney is diverse, it's young, it's talented, it is aspirational, and it's growing at an extraordinary rate. But we also need to respond to it, because uh, unless we get the planning right, we won't be able to seize the economic opportunities that it represents. Now, good infrastructure is absolutely central to this, and investing in infrastructure has always been core business for reforming Labor governments. I've said many times that one of the most rewarding experiences of my life was serving as Minister for Infrastructure under Prime Ministers Rudd and Gillard, and I acknowledge my friend Mike Murdoch and the role that he played. Uh, as the Secretary of the Department of Infrastructure during that time, and other people who are here, including Kerry Schott, who was in the, on the IA board, and, and, and others, uh, when you had a national government that made appointments based upon merit to positions. One of the reasons why I've always enjoyed engaging with this group, and I've spoken here before, uh, with a, a different title, it must be said, this one's much better, is because you share an understanding that infrastructure isn't an end in itself. We don't build for the sake of it, for the chance to turn a sod or cut a ribbon. We build to last for the long term. We invest in infrastructure because we know it empowers productivity. It supports growing communities. It creates jobs. It rewards aspiration. It boosts access to services and it improves quality of life. For me, infrastructure is never just about roads and railways and runways. It's about living standards and job opportunities and productivity and community pride and quality of life. Look at Western Sydney Airport, a long-standing passion of mine and a transformational infrastructure project. One I spoke about in my first speech to the parliament way back in 1996. It took us a while to get there, but get there we did. It will be a catalyst for economic activity in Western Sydney. It changes the dynamic of this city. It means uh, for the first time, we're not pointing in towards the CBD. Sydney will be looking out towards a focal point for that economic piece of infrastructure. The best drivers of regional economic activity that you can do anywhere in the world, this is regarded by economists. There are two things you could do. The first is a university, and I'm very proud that uh, I was president of Young Labor when we presented uh, a petition the length of Macquarie Street uh, to the then New South Wales Labor government for a university to be held in Western Sydney. And uh, Chris and others uh, were very much a part of that. Uh, the second is an airport. And why, why are both of those, why are they better than 
other pieces of infrastructure because they're a catalyst that have a massive multiplier because of what they bring uh, once you have those particular, uh, particular centrepieces uh, to growth in a region. Western Sydney Airport will create fair wage secure jobs closer to where people live. And I'm pleased to say that the project is tracking very well. It's more than the third complete and on schedule to start operating in late 2026. It's not only a great project in itself, it's a great project that's being done well. It's creating local jobs, it's being constructed sustainably. The project has used almost no potable water and has used more than 5 million tonnes of crushed sandstone from the Sydney Metro and West Connex tunnelling projects. And it will operate sustainably. The final airport precinct will be gas free. It will use solar panels and will use less electricity, water and liquid fuels. Of course, there's no point building a new airport without making it easy for people to get there. And that's why I've always been a big supporter of the Sydney Metro, Western Sydney Airport rail line, which we're delivering as part of the Western Sydney City deal. This will be a game changer for the new Western Parkland City and the Aerotropolis surrounding the airport, connecting residents with jobs, education and training, services, goods and markets. And I'm proud that our government is committing $5.25 billion to the project. My colleagues, particularly those who have the privilege to represent this area, see the Western Sydney Airport as a generator of prosperity across a range of sectors, including research, tourism, education, advanced manufacturing, logistics and residential development. I think we can all agree that one of the key lessons of the pandemic is the importance of resilient supply chains. Strong and reliable freight infrastructure is central to this. And the Moore Bank in a modal terminal precinct is a national success in this regard. Uh, the import-export terminal has been operating since 2019, and we expect the interstate terminal to be completed in 2025. I'm very proud of uh, the role that the former government and myself as Infrastructure Minister with Infrastructure Australia's recommendations played in Moore Bank in a modal. It's not as uh, sexy as a new airport, but it is damn important uh, for changing the dynamic uh, of the economy in southwest Sydney. By moving more container freight by rail, the Moorbank Terminal will save around 3,000 truck journeys every day. That's a big impact on traffic and key arterial roads like the M5, a big boost in productivity and it will provide a net save of around 110,000 tonnes of carbon emissions a year. We do need to plan better our infrastructure, and that's why at the last election we committed to investing in planning and preparatory works for the Castle Ray Connection, a project that I know that the dialogue here in Western Sydney has championed for a long time. This is a long-term project that recognises a long-term reality that we need to take flood and other extreme weather events into account when planning infrastructure investments. We've also announced further investment for better planning on other key road projects, including Bandon Road and Richmond Road, and to guide future decision making and to take the politics out of planning, we will establish a Western Sydney expert panel to review and report on Western Sydney's infrastructure needs. I think Susan Templeman's op-ed today is a, a, a reminder of why you need uh, better planning uh, to avoid ongoing debates with that, which then don't result in actual investment and action. Getting transport links right is vital, but the businesses that this infrastructure will help to serve also need human capital to grow and thrive. Now, at the Western Sydney Jobs Summit in August, nearly one in three businesses reported difficulty finding suitable staff and most cited a lack of experience or skills as a major factor. This is a common factor right around Australia and addressing these skill shortages was one of the key priorities for the National Jobs and Skills Summit that we held in Canberra last month. 
We brought together businesses, unions, community leaders and state and local government, and we agreed on some immediate actions to help address critical skills shortages, including a skills and training blitz so that we can offer more fee-free places in TAFE, creating a larger pool of skilled workers locally, and increasing the number of people in our permanent migration program and investing additional funds to process visas and deal with the visa backlog. As I said at the time, we don't see migration as a narrow exercise in importing workers to fill workforce gaps. And I think people in Western Sydney instinctively understand that reforming the migration program is about so much more than that. We need to learn the lessons of the pandemic. When Australia shut its borders, we'd become over-reliant upon temporary labour, so that when the borders were shut, unlike New Zealand as well that encouraged people to stay and provided a path to permanency, we told everyone to go home and then wonder why there's skill shortages when we want to open up the economy again. Makes absolutely no sense. But it makes no sense not just in terms of the economy, it makes no sense uh, for the people who are directly affected as well because people in Western Sydney understand that reforming the migration program is about helping people to put down roots. It's about making a home, raising a family, starting a business, buying in, joining up. That's what migration's about, uh, not something that's a one-way deal, something that uh, benefits uh, the economy, benefits people as well in making Australia our home and giving them a sense of ownership and to join the millions of people who, with the exception of First Nations people, were all either migrants or descendants of migrants. And we need to, I think, give people that sense of security where possible as well. And so my government is unashamedly reorienting the migration program to that end. The government is also supporting smaller infrastructure in our local communities too. Now I remember growing up how much it meant to have a place to play outside. There was just concrete in uh, my backyard and uh, it was about as small as this platform here too. Um, people need uh, the space as we get urban density, that's important. Uh, we need to make sure that families uh, have uh, somewhere to engage with. Another lesson from the pandemic, when the COVID lockdowns were on, uh, how important was it when the state government, to their credit, uh, changed the regulations so that people could go and have a picnic? The parks were full. <laughs> The parks were absolutely chock-a-block because people were desperate to engage socially as well. And as the nature of our families change as well, people are looking for areas of social interaction. It's why you can get a good coffee, not just in Surrey Hills, but in Blacktown, in Liverpool, in Campbelltown, anywhere, anywhere in Australia, indeed, every country town, because people as family groups are less, uh, are smaller. They're looking for ways and spaces that are public uh, to interact. And we need to support that as well. It's why good quality community infrastructure, the best ones delivered through local government, uh, make a difference as well. So in Western Sydney, uh, in the budget, in just a couple of weeks time, uh, you'll see the funding fulfilling the commitments that we made to a new water play area for Schofields, new walking trails for Grantham Farm, synthetic footy fields for Cook Park in St Mary's, new change rooms and improving disability access in the grandstand for Mount Druitt Town Rangers Football Club. Projects like these mightn't make uh, headlines, uh, but they make a powerful difference to the quality of life as well. Now, just as we invest in roads and rail and runways and public spaces with the goal of lifting 
living standards in the immediate term and delivering productivity gains and economic benefit over the long term. The government is also investing in policies that help with the cost of living here and now, while also delivering long-term economic dividends. And childcare is the perfect example. Childcare costs have gone up by 41 per cent over the past eight years. This is a significant burden to many Australian families who are already battling to make ends meet, particularly in parts of Western Sydney. And costs and distortions in the system mean that too many parents, particularly women, are effectively penalised if they want to work more than three days a week. In other words, the childcare that you need to work costs more than you earn. It's just wrong. Childcare benefits two generations of Australians simultaneously, provides early education for children, and we know that human brain development in the first five years, uh, more than 90% of capacity is already there. But it also helps with the cost of living for working families and, importantly, greater economic opportunity for Australian women. And that's why cheaper childcare was our largest on-budget commitment uh, during the election campaign. And uh, Jason Clare uh, has introduced the legislation to Parliament uh, just last week that will reduce the cost of childcare for over 1.2 million families. What does that mean locally? Well, 11,000 families in Parramatta, 10,000 in the Penrith LGA alone, to give you just two examples. Importantly, this is not welfare. This is economic reform. Economic reform that boosts productivity, boosts workforce participation and boosts economic growth. It takes pressure off family budgets without adding to inflation because of the boost to productivity which is there, which boosts not just family economic outcomes, it boosts the economic outcomes for businesses as well if you get greater workforce participation. We understand as well as this uh, that we need to do more to address cost of living pressures and that's why our cheaper medicines policy has also now gone through the House of Representatives. Uh, since uh, Labor, it's only Labor that ever does the big things, uh, introduced uh, the pharmaceutical benefits scheme some 75 years ago. This is the first ever reduction in the price of medicines in 75 years, going from $42.50 down to $30, making an enormous difference. Now, we also understand as well that this week's decision by the Independent Reserve Bank to increase interest rates will make things harder for many households. These consecutive rate increases began under the former coalition government and are occurring in the context of global economic uncertainty driven by inflationary pressures. Right now, advanced economies are seeing the steepest and most synchronised global monetary policy tightening in decades. This only reinforces how important it is for fiscal policy to complement monetary policy, so as to not provide an incentive for monetary policy to be even more contractionary. Our priority is an economy that works for people, not the other way around. And that's why my colleagues and I are approaching the upcoming budget responsibly and methodically taking full account of the increasingly uncertain global economic outlook and recognising the long-term fiscal pressures of funding vital programs such as aged care, the NDIS, hospitals and defence and national security, as well as the growing costs of servicing a record national debt when interest rates are rising. We will make sure we do what we can to help families with their cost of living in a way that doesn't push up inflation or add pressure to demand. And as I've said before, we're prepared to make difficult decisions to get Australia through hard times and to ensure our fiscal policy provides a sustainable path forward in the immediate circumstances as well as the longer term. In short, our budget will be responsible. It will be focused on strengthening Australia's economic resilience so we can protect and enhance people's living standards. The final point I want to touch on today is climate change. 
Since July 2019, Western Sydney has felt the brunt of five natural disasters, including storms and severe floods, two of them earlier this year, and we face a nervous weekend uh, coming up. You understand the urgency of responding to the challenge of climate change because communities like yours are already living with the consequences. Now, we know that Australia has always had extreme weather events, so you can't say that you know, any particular event is because of climate change. But what you can say is that the science told us that extreme weather events would be more intense and would happen more often. And the science, tragically, is being proven to be very prescient and very correct. So it is, it, it is extraordinary that uh, in most places of, uh, of the world, uh, this is not contentious and is not ideological. In Europe, in, in our region, uh, it's, it's a given. But here, uh, for a decade, instead of working with you on solutions, the government's been part of the problem. Uh, the private sector and the business community were so far ahead of, of where governments were. And I pay tribute to business leaders like Jennifer Westacott, who's here today, uh, for her leadership uh, on these issues. From our first day in office, we've been working to fix it. Our Powering Australia plan will support a clean energy transformation that will increase access to cheap and reliable energy and drive down costs. The 400 community batteries we'll install across the country, including in Cabramatta and Bidwell, will enable homes with solar and to store excess energy produced during the day for use in the evening, or share the power they generate with other homes in the community. These community batteries will be complemented by the solar banks we have committed to rolling out across Australia to ensure more households can benefit from rooftop solar. And this policy work is being led by another great advocate for Western Sydney, uh, the Minister, Chris Bowen. We're also establishing a new urban rivers and catchments program to help restore habitats for native species. And it's not just birds and frogs who benefit from these projects. Healthy river and creek vegetation corridors provide cooler spaces that lower urban temperatures and improve air quality. Just as we've moved beyond the false choice between acting on climate change and growing the economy, we need to embrace the fact that a focus on sustainability is not the enemy of development, rather it is fundamental to its success. In conclusion, can I say that I've been very grateful for the opportunity today to talk to you about some of the things that we're doing and why we're doing them. But I'd like to end by emphasising how we're doing it, because that's just as important. By being collaborative, by consulting and cooperating, by bringing people together and really listening to communities like we did at the Jobs and Skills Summit and we continue to do with the airport development. I've always believed that when you get people involved in a dialogue, you get better ideas at the beginning and better results at the end. My government, I think, in our early months has been characterised by looking for what unites people rather than what divides them. And it appears uh, my uh, people who sit opposite us in the chamber haven't quite got that memo yet. Uh, they're still looking uh, for every disagreement possible, every nuance which is there. But uh, we're being really straightforward uh, with people as we meet the challenges which are there. Because I think that the better results that we'll achieve from more collaboration is important. When everyone helps lay a strong foundation, you can build to last. And in the uncertain times the world is facing, working together is more important than ever because Australia is not immune from international economic pressures. We're not immune either from the uncertain national security and international security environment uh, that we face. Who would have thought that there'd be a land war uh, taking place in Europe? Something we thought was confined to something of the past. 
But at heart, I've always been an optimist about our country's future. I have a great deal of faith in the smarts and the skills and the potential of our people and their ability to rise to any challenge. And whenever I'm in Western Sydney, that faith is very much renewed. I see every reason to be optimistic for the future of Western Sydney and for our nation. And the fact that 700 people have uh, joined with us uh, today is an indication of uh, the passion and commitment that is there uh, from across the board uh, to help build this region as well to achieve great outcomes. So I thank you for the work that you do for the benefit of this great community and I look forward to working with you on further collaboration and making a difference each and every day that I have the great privilege of leading this government. Thank you. Just before you go, mate, the, as we said, you spoke about um, flooding. Much of Western Sydney, from Canterbury Banks down to the Hawkesbury, is going to have a very wet weekend. Uh, I've got a brother at Windsor whose family's been evacuated three times in two years. Um, I know there's nothing you or the Premier can do this weekend to stop that, and I know you're staying the long-term stuff with climate change and discussion. Where do you think we'll get to, and what do you think two governments can do to give um, some hope, not only to life, but to livelihood? across a region that probably we shouldn't have built there 200 years ago, but we did. Um, do you get a sense that there's, there's an answer that you can, you can strike, at least in a medium term? Well, I, I, I'll tell you the obvious answer, which is stop development on floodplains. Um, that's something that, that, that you can do, is make sure uh, that uh, you don't make circumstances worse, and that is planning. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, um, uh, we have, uh, I think, uh, shown a, a very much a commitment uh, to producing uh, real solutions. Uh, I note your idea of a, a, a dialogue, and we're always up for, for dialogue. Uh, but you do need to take the politics out of it. I think you need to take the uh, economic incentives as well out of it in terms of you know, you, you don't do something so that you can then open up for more development. Development needs to happen. I'm, I'm pro-urban density, as you know, uh, for example, but it needs to happen in the right places, in the right way, in order to build uh, support. Uh, I've been out with uh, Susan Templeman uh, too many times in, uh, in, in recent months and years, uh, tragically and uh, we need to uh, address it. But in, in the long term as well, of course, uh, you know, things will get worse unless we actually bite the bullet uh, on, on climate issues. But obviously we need to deal with uh, immediate challenges uh, as well. And you waited a long time to be Prime Minister to really play trains. You, you are a bit of a fan of fast rail, faster rail, high speed rail. No one, else, no, no one really knows about those things or me, but we want to train quicker between Newcastle and Canberra through, through, through this part of town. You've appointed a, you talked about the Fast Rail Commission you're going to put together. What sort of time frame should we all be looking at getting our ideas together to contribute? State government's done plenty of work. You've been doing some work. Where do you, where do you think the next, during this term, what will happen on Fast Rail? Well, look, a, a lot of work was done. An example of uh, the work that was done was uh, the pre-work on, on high-speed rail. Uh, one of the things that I think has characterised uh, my uh, political involvement uh, as a, a shadow minister and then a minister for, for six years, if you look for the model that I, that I did, which is why some people I don't think were paying any attention or maybe they've forgotten in the long time we've been in opposition, um, I set up structures to deliver it, whether it be Infrastructure Australia that had people like Kerry Schott and Heather Ridout and Ken Henry and serious people on the board. We also set up uh, the process for a high-speed rail authority. And in that, uh, we had Tim Fisher, a former uh, leader of the National Party and Deputy Prime Minister, passionate high-speed rail advocate. Uh, had Jennifer Westacott, the head of the BCA, so that no one could say, you know, this was just a sort of feel-good thing. Uh, to bring in the, 
a hard economic analysis. We had a, a rep from the RTBU. Uh, we had a rep from uh, local government. Uh, you know, it was a serious, uh, it was a serious body, and it made, it did a lot of work. It produced uh, two reports that are there. Uh, high speed rail does stack up economically. Uh, the Sydney to Melbourne was two dollars forty five for every dollar invested. Essentially, it was what popped out. Uh, that's a pretty good BCR uh, for a, a major infrastructure project like that because, and the, what really accelerated it, of course, uh, was the regional economic development along the route as well. So you need the faster, like non-stop trains, but you also need ones that are fast but stop a few times which accelerates growth and development. Um, Canberra is not just our national capital, it's Australia's largest inland city. And Canberra has enormous uh, prospects for growth, for example. And one of the ways that we take pressure off the East Coast capitals is through regional economic development. Uh, but you've got to have strategies for that as well. Uh, so I think um, we will have uh, some uh, funding in the budget uh, to establish an authority which we committed to and then we need uh, the work to be undertaken. There's uh, some commitments for faster rail in an immediate sense. There's some things you can do uh, quickly uh, between Sydney and Newcastle in particular. Uh, but uh, you know, if you're going to have that, uh, that long-term uh, economic benefit uh, it does. Uh, it does certainly stack up. Thank you. Well, I might ask uh, Andrew Irvine, the group head of uh, business and private banking at NAB, to vote a vote of thanks to the PM. He's ever seen. <laughs>